All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Good morning. Good morning. We just had a spirited worship session. We have the, the brothers on the conference call. And we are streaming live. I want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we go into our men's Sunday school lesson. Uh, if you would, uh, turn with me to the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 28. Hebrews 12 and 28. And as you uh, travel to that text, which is t tightly tucked away, um, we find ourselves right now uh, in a season of transition and change. Um, and uh, depending upon your perspective and your leanings, you feel a little shook up right now. Uh, if you're living here in these United States uh, of America. And uh, every four years we face uh, a changing of the guard. We, we face uh, elections that sometimes can decide uh, how the country will be governed uh, over the next four years uh, by whether it's a president or senator, governor, we have these elections at regular intervals. And so um, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that kingdoms and governments and empires rise and they fall, they are set up, and they're torn down. Um, but there's something that when we feel uh, shaken by these different um, transitions in life, that there are, are some things that are sure, and those are the things that we need to uh, be thankful for and to hold on to. So uh, join me in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. I'll read it uh, for our hearing out of the New King James Version. And it reads on this fashion. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For the time that we have to share together this morning, I want us to think from the thought, when kingdoms shake. When kingdoms shake. So, uh, obviously, uh, we have reached a point where all of the major news organizations have called the United States presidential uh, election for uh, the, the Democratic candidate, Joseph Biden. Okay? And with that call of an election, we have a nation that voted in a very tight race. Very tight race. And so you have a little more than half of the country that is celebrating right now at the hopeful expectation of what the next four years can bring. But at the very same time, we have a little less than half the country that is in uh, a state of despair about the very same thought, and they look at the exact same situation with dread of uh, the changes that may come under a new administration. Four years ago, we had a similar situation, but just the shoe was on the other foot. You had uh, those that have more of a bluish hue were down in the dumps. And those that have uh, a more uh, reddish tendency 
we're celebrating in the streets. So when we see that in a democracy that we have, with the great gift that we have of voting for our representatives in government, that things can change from one election to another. And we see throughout secular history and biblical history that empires have been set up and they've fallen down. The same nations have been governed by different kings. And so how ought the believer then live in light of these ever-changing circumstances regarding political waves to and fro. Well, the good news is that the Apostle Paul, or the, the, the writer of Hebrews, um, gives us some instructions on what to do when kingdoms shake when kingdoms shake. So the entire book of Hebrews, the writer is trying to get across to Christians who come from a Hebrew background that there is something greater and something better in Jesus Christ than what they formerly served in terms of the law. He's continually trying to get them to see through comparison and through contrast between different things that they knew in the law and what they should now know in Christ. And so as he concludes his 12th chapter, he is summing up part of his argument and he starts with the word, therefore, letting us know that what he's about to say is summing up some things that he's already said. And so he tells us, since we are receiving a kingdom, so he's letting his audience know that in light of us as the body of believers, in, in light that we are receiving a kingdom, there are some things that we need to take into account. The first thing is that we need to take into account that our current kingdom is different from the coming kingdom. Our current kingdom is different from the coming kingdom. God is sovereign over all earthly kingdoms. Take a look with me at Job chapter 12, verses 23 through 25. Job chapter 12, verses 23 through 25. Let me show you what the Bible says about God's interactions with the nations of the world. It says in New King James Version, he makes nations great and destroys them. He enlarges nations and guides them. He takes away the understanding of the chiefs of the people of the earth and makes them wander in pathless wilderness. They grope in the dark without light, and he makes them stagger like a drunken man. <laughs> if you've lived in the United States the last four years, you might feel like the nation's been staggering about like a, dr a drunken man. This, this, this is timeless, but it's also timely. It seems like it was just written yesterday. But yet this passage is thousands of years old. So the, the biblical perspective is that God is sovereign over all earthly kingdoms, and he makes them whatever he sees fit for them to be. So in light of that, even though we go and we vote, as Pastor Skinner uh, talked about last week, the lot is cast in the lap. But every decision is from the Lord. So we've got to look at, okay, if God is sovereign over all earthly kingdoms, what's the difference between the current kingdom and the coming kingdom? Well, the current kingdom, the current kingdom, you've got to look beyond 
a human government. You've got to look beyond red elephants and blue donkeys. You've got to look beyond just what you can see with your eyes, but you have to look at the entire world system when we're talking about the current kingdom. It might surprise you to, uh, to, to hear what I'm about to say in terms of who is the current ruler of our current kingdom. But I would advance the argument that it is the devil, it is Satan that is the current uh, ruler of our current kingdom. If you're surprised, I got some Bible to back it up. Go with me to Luke chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. Luke chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. It reads on this fashion. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, being Jesus, all this authority I will give to you and their glory. For this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Now, the surprising thing is not that the devil said this. What blew my mind is as I was looking through Luke, I was looking through Luke and I was like, where is the contradiction? It's not there. So Jesus never tells him that, no, you don't have authority over these earthly kingdoms. He doesn't ever say that they were not delivered to the devil, and he never said that he couldn't give them to whoever he wishes. Not in there. Not in there. So what does that tell me? That tells me that Jesus concurs. It must be the truth. Thank you, Pastor. It must be the truth. And so that should change if you didn't already have that perspective. That should change how you look at the entire world system. When you think that the current kingdom is ruled by Satan. If you're not convinced, come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Actually, I'll give you verse uh, 3 and 4 out of that chapter. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds in the God of this age has blinded. Also is talking about the devil called Satan. Who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So unless the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ shines on us. We'll be lost in this current kingdom. We'll be lost in this current kingdom. So no, it's not Donald Trump. It's not Joe Biden. It's not Boris. It's not Putin. It's not any of these presidents, prime ministers, dictators, none of these strong men weak men, kings nor queens, parliament nor congress, no, none of these individuals rule the current kingdom. But it is the devil who is called Satan. So if that's the current kingdom, then what's the coming kingdom? Well, I'm glad you asked. You asked all the right questions. Turn with me to John chapter 18, verse 36. John chapter 18, verse 36. Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now, my kingdom is not from here. So there is a coming kingdom, but it's not the current world system. But we see that this was before the kingdom has come, but the kingdom will come. And we see the description of this very same Jesus in Revelation 19, verse 16. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, 
king of kings and lord of lords. So the coming kingdom will be ruled by Jesus. The coming kingdom will be ruled by Jesus. And so again, we, we, we look at this kingdom that is coming and it's described in a very specific way that this kingdom that we are receiving, it says this kingdom we are receiving, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. It cannot be shaken. Now, if you live in another part of the country or if you travel to another part of a country, you may have experienced an earthquake. I, I can tell you from my personal experience uh, in my travels to California, that while I was there, this one particular time, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I was not moving, but the earth was. And all of a sudden, it started to shake the building that was in, that I was in, and the, the pictures began to fall off the wall, and things slid off of the tables, and and I'm not used to this. I'm used to hurricanes. I'm from Houston, Texas, y'all. My family's from Louisiana. I'm from the Gulf Coast. I'm used to being able to see that thing coming. But an earthquake gives you no warning. All of a sudden, just everything starts to shake. And so it's, it's nice to know that the coming kingdom, that it cannot be shaken. It cannot be shaken because God himself has taken the opportunity, not just in random earthquakes that are the result of tectonic plates shifting, but he has done it on purpose on at least two important occasions. Go with me to Exodus chapter 19, verse uh, 18. Exodus 19, verse 18 and you can read there that when, when uh, God came down to Mount Sinai, that the whole earth uh, shook around that mountain. And also, if you go to Matthew 27, verse 51, when we are uh, being given the gospel according to Matthew, uh, written, and we're giving the, the recording at the the foot of the cross it says and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit then behold the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split so we see that at the delivery prior to the delivery of the ten commandments and immediately uh, at the crucifixion God saw fit to shake the earth but thus far, he's, he's shaken the earth, but there will come a time that not only will he shake the earth, but he will also shake heaven. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 13, verse 13. Therefore, I will shake the heavens, and the, the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. So there's going to be a time when God is going to shake everything up. Shake up. He's going to shake everything up. And so it's comforting to know that God has shaken and will continue to shake the earth at certain times. And that at some point he's even going to shake up heaven. But this coming kingdom that we are receiving is a kingdom which cannot be shaken. It cannot be shaken. So believers, believers ought to live as citizens, not of the current kingdom, but of the coming kingdom. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we ought to live not as a citizen of Houston, a citizen of Texas, a citizen of the United States, not live as a Republican, not live as a Democrat, 
but we ought to live as citizens of an eternal coming kingdom. I am a native Houstonian, a native Texan, but my citizenship is in heaven. That is the first way that I am identified is with heaven. Regardless of what you may have heard in the past, because there are pastors and preachers out there that will try to convince you. There's a pastor between first and third that will try to tell you that God is a Republican. But I assure you there are no red elephants in the Bible. I, I assure you that just because Jesus rode on a donkey doesn't mean that he was a Democrat. So it's difficult for me to be convinced that my first identification should not be with heaven or my country or my state or my city, but to some political party with some animalistic mascot. Citizens of the kingdom. So what shall we do now that we know the current kingdom and we are waiting, as Philippians says, eagerly for the Savior, for the coming kingdom. What shall we do? How shall we live going forward? In light of this coming kingdom that cannot be shaken, we are encouraged to have grace. We are encouraged to have grace. In Hebrews 12 and 28, it says, Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Now, that's how it's rendered in the New King James Version. Okay. I, I do like how I've read it in the New American Standard Bible. It renders it slightly differently, but I think it gives us Something that not just that we should feel, but something that we should do. L listen to how the NASB renders this. Uh, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. So having grace can also be rendered or translated as showing gratitude. So when we have grace, that's something that's personal to us, that we are experiencing ourselves. But when we show gratitude, that's our response to what's already happened to us internally as an immaterial being, that we have grace, then we ought to show gratitude. That we ought to show gratitude to God and to others because of what has happened to us and what has been provided for us. We should be thankful of the coming kingdom. Look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. And his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but regardless of your political affiliation, every single administration that you try to put up will eventually be destroyed. However, there is one kingdom, which will not be destroyed. And that is the very kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we should be thankful of the coming kingdom and that we are a part of it. So if we know we're in a, coming, in a current kingdom, but we're living in light of the coming kingdom, and we know that we ought to show gratitude for having grace, how do we practically work that out in our daily lives? 
outstanding question. Thank you for asking. Let's go back to the text again. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. By which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. We must approach God in a manner he deems acceptable. We cannot approach God just any way that we decide to approach God. He's too great for that. He's too glorious for that. The Bible tells us, and and actually our, our, our guest preacher, pastor this morning, Pastor Williams, quoted this very same passage of John 4 and 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So there ought to be some exuberance about what you have to offer in terms of your worship because of how great and grand and glorious God is. But also at the same time, it ought to be done in truth meaning everything that we do should correspond with what he's revealed to us in his will and in his written word. Spirit and truth. See, when the two are not held in balance, you get a, you get a problem. Then you get people that are on live streams and TV that uh, uh, start trying to Use the spirit in their own way. They start vain repetitions to aggrandize themselves. So we have to be careful that we always hold spirit and truth together. So we must approach God in the manner he deems acceptable. And we are commanded to do at least two things in order to approach God in an acceptable fashion, because he's told us. Go to Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 30. Leviticus 19 and verse 30. We are commanded to show reverence in our service. We are commanded to show reverence in our service. Look at what the Bible says, Leviticus chapter 19, verse uh, 30. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my my sanctuary. I am the Lord. So we, we ought to keep the commandments that he's given us and reverence his holiness. Whether that's in the sanctuary, the physical building, or whether that's inside his providential protection, because he is the Lord. So he tells you what and then tells you why. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. Why? I am the Lord. Because it conforms to his character. Because what God thinks and says is reality. It is truth. God does not have opinions. We have opinions. What God says is truth. And if you go down just two verses, we see an illustration of not just showing reverence, but we ought to feel a sense of awe, or as uh, the New King James renders it, godly fear. Leviticus 19, verse 32, just go down two verses. You shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of an old man and fear your God, I am the Lord. So, as a practical application, we ought to respect and, and honor our elders. And God says this because... 
what he has deposited in our elders over their years of life and their leadership should be respected and it is a reflection of your submission to God that you're able to submit and respect what God has set up as his leadership structures. And it says, fear your God. Again, it tells you what to do. Rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of the old man and fear your God. And again, why? I am the Lord. The Lord should not have to convince you and reason with you on certain things once you come to faith. It's one thing to have a reasonable faith that we have the ability to explain to people who are not believers or people that are not yet mature in the faith how it's reasonable and how things work and connect in a systematic sense, how truth is communicated in the Bible. But also at the same time, uh, it should not be like a child that is being forced to eat their vegetables, where as an adult, you know what it is that you need to do and what you should do, but you're refusing to do it, clenching your lips together because you don't want to eat your vegetables. In a spiritual sense, we ought to be receptive to what God says because God said it. And that should settle it. That ought to settle it. So we are commanded to show reverence in our service. And also we ought to feel a sense of awe or godly fear. So the reason to serve God is because he is the Lord. He set up the setup. He is the creator and the sustainer of all things. Look at Isaiah 45, verse 5. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. And this is an encouragement. If you have not yet come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I will gird you, though you have not known me. That before you even recognize Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your entire life, he's been looking out for you. To gird you would mean to hold you up. Jesus has been holding you up from your very first breath. Regardless of your recognition of who he is, there's something called common grace that we all experience regardless of our eternal destination. We all have 24 hours in a day. We all have the same sunshine that comes down upon us. We all experience the same rain. It rains on the just and the unjust alike. But God has not withheld this common grace from you, even though you stand opposed against him. It is only by his grace that you got up this morning, that you're able to hear me with your ears. And if you're talking back to me, that you could talk with your mouth, that you could have the activity of your limbs and the faculty of your mind. It is only by his grace. And since we have grace, then we ought to show gratitude. So the reason to serve God is because he is the Lord. And service, not just to God, but to others, is a demonstration of our gratitude for salvation. Turn with me to Hebrews. We're in, in the same book, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9 through 12. Hebrews chapter 6 Verse 9 through 12 it reads on this fashion out of the New King James Version. But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. 
For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the the saints and do minister. And we desire that each of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I close with this, saints. I want you to be confident of the better things concerning you. That in this nation, there can be better things concerning you. In this state, in this city, in your own household, on your job, there can be better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. So meaning that these are all nice things to have, but the best thing we have is salvation. All these things would be added unto us. But first we seek the kingdom and its righteousness. God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love. Saints, don't get tired right now. Keep on pushing. Keep on doing the work of the Lord. Keep on loving each other because that work and labor of love that you've ministered to the saints in the past and that you do minister, that you are continuing to do, show that same diligence in the full assurance of hope until the end, until the end, till I collapse. There has to be diligence that works out of the hope that I have until the end. Don't become sluggish, but imitate those, those who have given us a great example, those that have gone before us, those who have shown us the way to live because they have imitated Christ, and how they have imitated Christ, we seek to imitate them. And watch this, through faith and patience, inherit, inherit the promises. As a believer, you are set up to inherit the promise of this coming kingdom. And that is the good news. That's good news that as you have accepted Jesus Christ, you've recognized Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you now are set to inherit the promises through faith and also through patience. So let us have patience with each other as well. Let us have patience with each other, especially in this time of transition, political change, the pandemic that has put so many of us in different situations than we found ourselves. Have faith and have patience Because in the end, you will inherit the promises. May God bless you and keep you is my prayer. Amen. And so that concludes our men's Sunday school lesson, our men's Sunday school lesson. And it just so happens, if I'm correct, Pastor, that Hebrews is our... um, uh, assigned reading. So I encourage you to um, look at the program that was emailed out and uh, search the scriptures for yourself just as the Bereans uh, were commended uh, to search the scriptures for yourself and see um, about these things uh, on your own time and devotional study. Amen. Amen. May God bless you and keep you as our prayer. Enjoy the balance of your day and have a blessed week. Amen. Amen.